All righty, it's looking like we got a study brew for two minutes past the hour, so I'll go ahead and get this started. So welcome. Thank you all so much for joining us today. My name is Drew Scammell, pronouns he, they, and I'm a program associate with the Into the System Ecosystems for Equity and Diversity, or IC program at the American Association for the Advancement of Science. On behalf of the Improving Undergraduate STEM Education, or IUS initiative, I would like to welcome you to today's NSF Proposal Preparation Webinar for the IUS Engaged Student Learning, or ESL track, featuring NSF Program Officer, Dr. Jennifer Ellis. Before I hand it over to our NSF colleague, I have a few housekeeping notes that I'd like to go over with y'all. This presentation is being recorded and the recording will be made available in the coming weeks on the NSF Noise website, which is nsfnoise.org, and also the AAAS IUS initiative website, which is AAAS-IUS.org. And you'll also receive an email with the link to the recording and the slides when it's available. Additionally, we have closed captioning for the session offered via Zoom, you can download and view the full transcript by clicking the CC button at the bottom of your screen. And with that, that's all I got on my end. So I'll hand it over to our esteemed NSF colleague, Dr. Jennifer Ellis, for today's webinar. Hey, everyone. I thought the intro was a little bit longer. <laughs> so give me one, one second just to pull my uh, slides up and so I can share my screen. I'm just joking. I'm ready. <laughs> all right. Let me let actually put in. I'm I normally in um have dual computer screens, and I don't have that today. So I just got one screen. So I'm going to share my screen. And I will share the presentation. Do you all see regular presentation mode? Yep, looks good on our end. Okay, perfect. Well, thank you all for joining us. Happy Halloween, post-Halloween. Hopefully you have some good uh, candy, some clearance candy that you purchased this morning from your local drugstore or uh, grocery store uh, and, and enjoyed the, the sales or had fun yesterday um, with um, all the festivities. But I'm Jennifer Ellis. I'm the lead of the Robert Noyce Teacher Scholarship Program. Um, and typically we have um, more than one program officer joining us today, but maybe they had too much candy. And so I'll be leading these slides. Um, and I also have listed here is um, Dr. Leah McCaster, Le Leah McCaster Shields, who is the co-PI of the Robert Noyce Teacher Scholarship Program. And the reason why I mentioned the Robert Noyce Teacher Scholarship Program is because we help co-fund the Improving Undergraduates for STEM Education um, focus on K-12 STEM teacher preparation. So we use a combination of IU's funding and funding from NOISE to help support K-12 STEM teacher preparation. And so we're glad to share a bit of information about you focusing specifically on STEM teacher preparation and the hopes to receiving um, proposals from your institutions in January or July. I'll bring you greetings from the National Science Foundation's Division of Undergraduate Education, which is housed in the Directorate of STEM Edu Directorate for STEM Education, um, and the four core programs from the, the from DUE, which is the division that I am a um, rotating program officer from. We have five core programs: the Advanced Technology Education Program, which really focuses on our two year two year colleges, Improving Undergraduate STEM Education Program, which I'll elaborate on more throughout this presentation. Um, and then we also have a focus on his serving uh, of Hispanic serving institutions, the Robert Norris Teacher Scholarship Program, and then the um, NSF scholarships in STEM, which is we refer to as STEM. And as you see, we have acronyms for everything. Um, and so I'll be using these acronyms throughout the presentation and probably few that I may not, I, I may forget to uh, define. And so if I do forget to define it, just let me know and I'll be more than sure to provide explanation. Wanted to highlight a few deadlines. Um, the IU's deadline for level one is in January the 15th, um, 2025. So it's coming up. And so I'm assuming this is why most of you are here is to prepare for this January submission. There may be a few of you who are um, thinking about level two or level three um, proposals, which will be due in July of 2025. Um, making sure that I wanted to bring attention that we do have a new PAPG that um, became available in May of 2024, and there are some subtle changes. And so one of the changes you may notice for those of you who are more seasoned NSF um, PIs or uh, are more seasoned 
um, NSF proposal preparers. Um, there are changes in things like the um, postdoc mentoring plan. And so the focus is not just postdocs, but graduate students as well. And so making sure you take the time, if you're ever alerted that there's a new PAPG that has been um, um, made available, take time to make sure you, you go over that document to, to make sure you're prepared for those changes. So within these webinar talk topics, you're going to discuss what kind of think about what do you want to do um, potentially for an IUS proposal and kind of where does your work fit or does your work fit in IUS? Um, I'll provide an introduction to IUS, um, provide some descriptions of IUS and additional program details, some tips for success and additional resources that would be available. Um, feel free to ask questions in the chat. I'll pause throughout the presentation to allow for some Q&A and then allow enough time, hopefully in the end. I'll try to talk as fast as I can to make sure I get through the bulk of the slides. Know that th this recording, this session is being recorded and the slides will be provided for you as Drew mentioned. So let's think a minute. Um, are you interested in making changes at your institution to improve student STEM learning and engagement? Using assessment to enhance what is known about effective STEM teaching and learning practices, considering the implications of the aforementioned factors for pre-service STEM teachers. If that's something that you've been thinking about, um, how can we really help enhance STEM teacher preparation and, and what, what it really is STEM teacher preparation? What are all the components that include STEM teacher, pre STEM teacher preparation? Is it our pedago pedagogical content knowledge? Um, courses, our method methodology courses? Is it our STEM courses? Is it a math course for educators? Is it our general education courses, which will include bio biology and what implication that has on students passing the praxis question, the praxis test or whatever the case may be, or being able to, to effectively teach STEM in elementary to high school level? So really, what are you interested in and improving with respect to STEM teacher preparation and all those components that imp impact STEM teaching, learning, and engagement? So if you want to, if you haven't done so already, I'm going to leave a little bit of time for you to write down or brainstorm one or two ideas for improving STEM teacher education that, that require financial resources. So is it you, you work with school districts, they've, they've come to you and say, we love your teachers. But when we're looking at, at the, the test data for mathematics, they're, uh, the teachers from your institution, you know, just historically are, are lacking, or maybe it's this benchmark historically that our students are struggling with. Is there something that you can do to help us prove here? So I'm going to stop talking and give you some time to kind of think through what are some ideas of approving STEM teacher education at your, at your institution that would require some financial resources? You, you have your idea now you've got you had more than the 20 or 30 seconds that I initially planned for this exercise for you to kind of think about if you had money, what would you need to infuse to help you enhance your STEM teacher preparation program? So what's next? Has looking to see has a similar has a similar project already been pro provided results? Check through literature, li li do it a lit search, and accept award search, um, your community's organization. Do you need collaborators? And if so, can you find them? And and who would they be? And so really thinking through what an idea for a proposal would be is, and, and then also is I use the right fit. So NSF has, has a few options that you may want to explore with respect to enhancing STEM teacher preparation. And I use is just one of them. Um, so there's two ways to check, making sure you read the solicitation uh, and, and having a talk with a program director like myself and others who are, are focusing on STEM teacher preparation. And we, we know enough about the other programs in STEM teacher preparation to let you know if this is a good fit for IUs or for other programs. And so know a little bit more about IUs and giving you an overview of what does that mean. Uh, what is IUs? Um, we're really thinking about imagining the future of undergraduate STEM education. So. IUS is, is really a core STEM education program that seeks to promote novel, creative, and, and transformative approaches to, to improving STEM education for all undergraduate students. And, and I'm going to pause here for, for, for a minute just to say novel and creative and transformative does not necessarily always have to be 
something that is not proven, right? So maybe there are some best practices in STEM teacher preparation that are long existing and they have not been implemented at your institution. That right there may be novel, because to me, novel is relative, creative is relative. It may be novel and creative creative at your institution because they have never been implemented. And you and you, you see the benefit of implementing these best practices that have been long standing for years on preparing, on successfully preparing today's STEM teachers and integrating those into your into your curriculum. That right there would be something that you consider. So you that couldn't that should be considered. So we don't want you to think that you have to create something um, from scratch for it to be considered novel. We are definitely um, um, appreciative of the research that has already been done on effective practices, and we would we would love to see proposals that that also do that. And those proposals that and you'll see that we have dear colleague letters on microelectronics and AI, all of the above are included, but we don't want to, I didn't want to leave, have you leaving here thinking that, oh, we've got to create this new approach that's never been done. It's okay to adopt something that has been proven um, that just hasn't been done at your institution. The program is open to applications from all institutions of higher education and associated organization. NSF places high value on education students to be leaders and innovators in emerging and rapidly changing STEM fields, as well as educating a scientifically literate public. If you can think about STEM teachers, that's one of the things that they're, they're, they're charged with doing is really training and developing a scientifically literate public. IU's edu um, EDU supports projects that seek to bring recent advances in STEM knowledge into undergraduate education that adopt, improve, and incorporate evidence-based practices in STEM teaching and learning, and that lay the groundwork for institutional improvement in STEM education. So the program goals here are similar to what was on the previous slide, to build knowledge about STEM teaching and learning at the undergraduate level, and by doing so, you would develop novel, creative, and transformative approaches to undergraduate STEM teaching and learning, to, inter to incorporate evidence-based practices in undergraduate STEM teaching and learning. And here you're focusing on adapting and improving and replicating and, in and including evidence-based practices in STEM teaching and learning for all undergraduates. And the last goal is to build and understand systemic changes in undergraduate STEM education. Here you'll be laying the groundwork for sustaining departmental, institutional, or, com or community transform transformation and improvement. So these are much larger scale than the first goal that I wrote. And so you can see how you go from a level one, two, to a three. So the structure of the STEM program are two different tracks. The engaged student learning, where you're developing, testing, and, and using uh, of teaching practices and curriculum and innovations that will engage students and improve improve learning, persistence, and retention in STEM. And then we also have the institutional and community transformation. And here, again, larger, looking, thinking about a larger scale, larger impact, where you're focusing on transformation of colleges and universities to implement and sustain highly effective STEM teaching and learning. So the IUS program tracks and levels. Um, we have three different levels. Um, level one is up to $400,000 for engaged student learning up to three years. And you can see the respective deadlines in that last column. And if you know anything, if you're, again, if you're a more veteran NSF person, uh, we have solicitations. And sometimes I think um, program directors, um, we um, have the assumption that everybody's, oh, everybody submitted an NSF grant and everybody knows how to read an, uh, a solicitation. No. Um, typically, when we have a solicitation, we may list um, the deadlines for the first couple of years, and then we'll do something lovely by saying the third Wednesday in January or the third Wednesday in, in July thereafter. And so that's kind of where we are. And I, I put in the initial slide what that actually meant as far as our dates, but this particular slide, I didn't update it for to give you July you know, 25th. I can't remember the, the date, um, but you know, hopefully that'll help you kind of understand what does that mean. And so if you don't see a date uh, and it says it's the current solicitation, you just have to go to your lovely calendar and figure out what the third Wednesday in July or, or January is for the upcoming year. And so we have the, the three different levels for uh, engaged learning and the, the duration, the amounts um, for those particular proposals as well as for institutional and community transformation. Um, we do have a capacity building, which is like a planning grant 
for a uh, in, in this area as well that you may want to consider. And I'm doing um, target more targeted and focused webinar focusing on STEM teacher prep, but I use that large for EDU. They do have webinars that will provide you a few more uh, details about each specific uh, track and those and those uh, deadlines for those particular webinars, I believe on the IU's website. And if they're not, feel free to email, email me and I will provide you um, that calendar of, of events. So you'll be able to attend those those uh, sessions as well. If you want to know more specific detail if this particular webinar, it provides you too broad of an overview and you have more specific questions about um, a particular track and or level. Um, so within the, the IU's track, we're really looking for evidence-based and knowledge generating. And so projects should be evidence, both evidence-based and knowledge generating. Evidence-based is the project building on prior work. Um, and it could be done at your institution or, you know, done across the discipline. Um, knowledge generating is what will be learned from the planned conduct of the project. And then the perspective. It is okay for IU's projects to serve the PI's institution, but they should also serve all of us by providing useful knowledge for a broad constituencies of educators. So really thinking about how can the work that you're doing on your campus really help the STEM teacher preparation community at large. So expectation of knowledge generation. All IU's um, projects are expected to increase knowledge about effective STEM education that may be achieved through poising one or more research questions that will be answered through the course of the study or evaluation of project activities, impacts, or outcomes. All this, is, all this research or evaluation methods with the questions poised and, and projects activities. And so all of those things, there, 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 should, there should be true alignment of um, the research or evaluation methods with the questions poised and project activities and clearly clear metrics and things of that nature to really help um, drive home the point that you fully understand the questions that you're asking and then how you will measure success and or impact as the project um, goes along. Successful IU's proposals will build on what is known, summarizing published literature and defining a, a starting point that exceeds the prior work include a well-designed plan to gather data, uh, specifically methods of, uh, I'm sorry, uh, specified methods of analysis that will be employed to answer the questions poised, include mechanisms to evaluate the success of the project, both formative and summative evaluation. So having it, an external evaluator uh, is helpful in this instance. And with, a, with an external evaluation, uh, external evaluator, they do not necessarily have to be external to your campus, but they do need to be external to the PI's um, department, um, things of that nature. So if you're from the School of Education, your external evaluator should not be from the School of Education. Can they become? Can they come from psychology? Yes. Um, could you hire an evaluation form? Yes. Um, but just letting you know what the realm of or the you know the the possibilities for what evaluation could look like. Explain how findings and materials will be shared and address the sustainability of project efforts um, and looking for collaboration as needed with other investigators, institution, or communities. What does, I, um, what does I use um, expect? Um, we are expecting um, to increase knowledge about effective STEM education, and this may be achieved through poising one or more research questions that will be answered through the course of the study or through, as I mentioned, the evaluation, and also looking for creative ways of dissemination the findings as expected. So looking for things that, of course, we're looking, you know, publications and conferences and things of that nature, but really thinking about the needs of the STEM teacher preparation community and what are the best and most effective and practical ways to share your findings to hopefully enhance other programs, not just at your campus. And so I, I went through this particular slide. And again, these slides will be helpful for you, but just giving you a different way of viewing what the, um, the funding looks like for the levels and the tracks. And I talked about the deadlines. And so there's a, um, if you wanted to scan this QR code for the uh, solicitation, you, you're more than free, more than welcome to do that. Um, and knowing about the respective deadlines. And in reading the solicitation is really key to um, making sure that you will be prepared for a successful proposal process.
Um, so some examples of uh, engaged student learning themes, um, assessment metrics for learning and practices, and STEM or pedagogical courses for teachers. So I, again, I, I don't want you to think that because this is focused on STEM teacher preparation, these courses have to be housed in just that domain where it, it has to be the uh, methodology courses or um, anything like uh, on that that focus on specifically um, pedagogy or pedagogical content knowledge or your TPK. Um, it can be how they can you can collaborate across campus on those courses that are are in the math department or in the science department, and they may have impact not just on STEM teachers or pre-service teachers or teacher candidates. And they may have a, a, a more institutional impact on all of the students who may have to take these general education and quotation science related or math related courses and their respective impact on STEM teacher preparation. Educational, re um, educational research on best practices in STEM teacher preparation, conducting undergraduate disciplinary research for STEM teachers, um, developing the STEM um, and STEM related workforce, including teachers, but not via scholarship. So thinking about what does that look like educating a STEM literate population, including STEM teachers, broadening participation in STEM, including STEM teachers, exploring co-curricular activities to increase student motivation and persistence in STEM teaching, STEM profession, faculty professional development, and including um, professional development for STEM teaching, um, STEM faculty teaching pre-service STEM teachers, um, and building capacity in higher education, including STEM teacher preparation programs or curricula. So these are just some sample engagements. And as you can see in the blue text, we try to, to customize it to help you think about what does this mean for me and my role in STEM teacher preparation? And so some, some sample institutional um, projects and um, some themes are looking at technology and distance education methods in STEM or pedagogical, pedagogical content courses for teachers and thinking of it post-COVID. What are some of the, the best practices, lessons learned that we learned from the pandemic that um, can that we need to think about in preparing today's teachers or some best practices that we've learned that can help transform how we prepare teachers? Um, institutional STEM, STEM planning efforts and investigations of evidence-based practices and institutional strategic planning and faculty rewards, STEM faculty professional development, including professional development for STEM faculty teaching, pre-service STEM teachers, development of instruments and metrics to assess institutional shifts towards evidence-based teaching practices in STEM or pedagogical courses for teachers, and, re and research studies on approaches for advancing change in the STEM undergraduate community, including STEM teacher preparation programs. Now, these are just some examples of ICT, sorry, um, and other themes are appropriate and many other applications to pre-service STEM teachers preparations are possible. So, you know, I provided both slides just to kind of help you think about what is an appropriate way to kind of to chunk what you're thinking about for either ICT or the education uh, courses. And I saw the chat was really live and active. And so I'm gonna pause here for some questions. And so I'll check the chat here. And so, and if you have some questions, feel free to unmute. So I have a quick question uh, regarding the evaluator, the external evaluator. So those people can be uh, can come from the, the our institution, for instance, the Department of Education, or no, those should be the outside. Like so, they should they can be internal to the institution, but external to your project. And okay, when can I you say that, some light on that. What's the so external to your project would mean if this project is focusing on. Um, you know, working with faculty in the College of Education or School of Education and biology. The external evaluator should not come from either one of those colleges. Could they come from psychology? Yes. Thank you. And I'm looking... So there's multiple ways. Again, I'm just highlighting a few things. There's multiple ways of improving STEM teacher uh, preparation and engaged student learning. Um, I see that. 
what would count as adequate prior work to build on a single qualitative study or as a or as or or a critical mass of papers needed before it is considered to be you don't need a critical mass of papers um you know just being able to demonstrate that this is not something that you just thought of overnight but you kind of done some pilot work on it um you've noticed there is trends um in either some deficits or some um you know even even if it's data that's provided from the from a local school district um of showing that there's some some shifts and trends on on how on student proficiency in such and such and so and so uh, and you wanted to try to see how if you made changes on the undergraduate level what impact that may have on um, making sure students were better equipped to teach X, X, Y, and Z that um, the district was showing uh, were having some issues. I have a question about, hi, thank you for taking our time out to kind of give us this insight. I have a question about whether or not um, out-of-school time STEM educators would be considered in this call. Maybe if you could define that for me. Yeah, absolutely. So STEM educators that teach at community centers, that teach in after school time programs. Or is this strictly K-12 educators or higher ed educators? So this the focus, the target focus would be either your undergraduate students who are have the aspiration and are being prepared to teach K to 12. Um students or mm -hmm. fac those faculty members and or those faculty members who are teaching these pre-service STEM teachers. Exactly. Those are your target audience. Now, where do they do that work? Could they could they be working in, in those areas that you identified as part of their practice and development? Yes. So can okay. you collaborate with museums or you know boys and girls clubs for after school programs? Exactly. Yes. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I have a question. So if, if our approach applies to both STEM and non-STEM fields, do you still consider it a fit or 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 that has to be specifically STEM? I think I would probably need a little bit more. So um it 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 would depend. So I can't give you a blanket yes without kind of maybe seeing a maybe a one pager about what you're you're thinking about. Mm -hmm. And when I know sometimes, again, some some things I think as program directors, we say words and we just assume everybody knows what that means. And so when I say a one pager, um, typically, if you have an idea about a proposal for a potential proposal, if you want to see if something is a good fit for a particular program, a program director will like, sure, I would love to talk with you. Just send me a one pager about okay. your idea. And we can have a discussion. What does that mean? If you're familiar with submitting grants to NSF, a one pager is really that project summary where it's like a maybe one or two paragraph summary about your idea. The next section is about the intellectual merit, kind of highlighting big picture, what you think the intellectual merit is of your particular project. And then the next section would be a broader impact. Ideally, that should fit on one page. That's why we call it the one pager. But that's really what helps kind of help helps us broadly understand what it is that you're um, trying to propose and then we'll have a, another discussion 20 30 minutes with you about your project to see if it's a good fit for i use if it's not a good fit for i use what other programs um would be better suited for your ideas is some of the types of things we like to do during those particular sessions um okay. i'm not sure of when when i use is having their next webinar about level one but if you email me, I will be able to um, find out for you. Um, we we are just finishing up our I use review panels from the July solicitation, and um, we are in the he heavy heaviness of the noise review panel session. And so a lot of our plates are pretty full. But I am definitely able to easily forward your email to the um, those on the I use team who are leading that effort to provide you a date and or when Drew sends out the um, the link as well as the uh, slides or access to the slides. Um, I'll be sure to provide dates and links to those webinars so you'll have access to that.
And so I see a question about, can in-service teachers be a part of this project? Yes, they can be a part. So if you needed mentors for your pre-service teachers, and I know pre-service teachers is, is kind of almost outdated for those of you who've adopted the EdTPA model or did at one point and your state said you no longer have to, we shifted um, to teacher candidates, but pre-service teachers or teacher candidates should be the primary focus as I mentioned, or um, and or faculty members, but you can include in-service teachers in the project, but they should not be the primary focus of this particular pro project. And you can have an advisory board. Um, and I, and I will I will admit my bias toward evaluation. I used to value. I'm I'm an evaluator at heart. I've evaluated multiple NSF programs, so I'm a big proponent of evaluation, not to check the box, but to help inform the PIs on um, whether or not um, you're doing what you said you wanted to do, and then also helping to provide you guidance on how to more effectively and efficiently run your project and, and give you that feedback on an annual basis or however you choose to provide that feedback. So having um, some form of an evaluation team, be it an external evaluator, an advisory board, or a combination of the two um, is, 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 is a really good um, way to um, support, I think, the PI team on um, making sure the project is successful. Hi, I have a quick question. I think you answer almost all of uh, my questions. So if I want to work with the uh, local uh, school district STEM teachers, they will the primary, but somehow I include undergrad, uh, the pre-service teachers. Would that be considered for the track two? So track this is again remember that the name of this so of this program is improving undergraduate STEM education. Right. Right. So your right. focus should be undergraduate students. Does NSF have other programs that will support um in-service teachers? Yes, and I'll highlight a few of those at the end. I use is not that. So your primary your your secondary use of in-service teachers would be more like mentors, but they should not be the focus of a of an IUS program because IUS is focusing on undergraduate students. And I see questions about computational thinking and computer science. And so all of that pre-K to eight teacher preparation, yes, that's an IUS appropriate um, term. A good time to submit a one pager. Send an email to um, and and I would say don't blast. You can, but I wouldn't recommend blast sending an email to all things I use for program directors on the I use website. They, we do list ourselves kind of by our our um, our specialty, if you will. And so emailing, it's fine to email one, or you can email a few of those team members per that discipline. So if you're, you know, for myself. Yes, I'm teacher prep, but I also do research in undergraduate um, engineering education. So depending on where I was kind of focusing my work, um, I could send an email to, you know, maybe one or two program officers in engineering to see, uh, does this proposal, is an I use worthy? Don't feel like, please don't send an email to all things I use pro program directors. Um, I mean, if you do, we, we figure it out always, but um, it's it's more helpful if you kind of, you know, send a more targeted um, email to those who really specialize in the area that's of your interest. Um, and so I'm going to go back to the slides and I see that I know there's a lot of questions, but I was just trying to keep you all for a power hour and those, those boxes kind of held me up a little bit. Um, so some collaborations, collaborations are encouraged among STEM disciplinary instructors, departmental institutional administrators, education uh, researchers. Project uh, proposal elements, you have your knowledge base of the project, project evaluation plan, um, except if you're doing a capacity building, which is kind of like a planning grant, relevant research questions, dissemination plan, and some form of sustainability um, plan as, as, as plan as well. All, you, all I use uh, projects are expected to increase knowledge about effective STEM education, and this may be achieved through poising one or more research questions that will be answered through the course of the study or through evaluation of the project activities, impacts, or outcomes. And so when you, for me, when I, my evaluation brain is like, oh, some kind of logic model or something like that to kind of help you determine what those activities, impact, and outcomes are. Not required, but for those of you who are familiar with 
with logic models that may be helpful, just as you're trying to think about what the project would look like with respect to eye use. Two possible ways to generate knowledge um, with your research questions or the evaluation project activities, um, the impacts or the outcome. Evaluation activities should be aligned with proposed activities and expected outcomes. Evaluation may be conducted by, as I said, an independent external evaluator by qualified members of the project team or guided by a project advisory board. And so, um, you know, having some, you know, we do, we do see a mix of internal and external evaluation, and we really encourage you to have um, some level of external and external evaluation along with it's fine to have somebody in your team who is going to do some internal evaluation but having that external voice be it through an external evaluator and or an advisory board is um, is, is highly advised and expected for an IUS program for your engaged student learning projects focus on improving student learning support development of improved instructional materials and our methods aims to engage students improve learning and increase retention in STEM um, ranges of approaches include um, these areas here of development and implementation of novel instructional methods and technologies. And so thinking about if you in include instructional um, communication or instructional technology or an educational technology to enhance teaching and learning, design and assessment of metrics to measure STEM teaching and learning of student outcomes, faculty learning through professional development, discipline, discipline based or interdisciplinary education research. Um, and I talked a little bit about the ICTs, and I won't focus so much on ICTs right now because we're, you know, we're looking at the January, but I'll, I'll read a few of these. So focusing on improving evidence-based instruction by academic departments, uh, institutions, and other organizations and communities, and aims to use appropriate theories of change to transform institutions, and a range of approaches in, that are included here. ICT proposals. Um, the systemic change at the departmental level, institutional or multi-institutional level or across communities of STEM educators. Um, <clears throat> really make sure you're describing the theory of change. You include research literature and theoretical, theoretical perspectives and recognize STEM higher education as a complex system and kind of where all of this fits. And so I've, I've talked about these levels, um, some, key, com, some key things to keep in mind. Um, and we talked about the deadlines and how to read the solicitation for those deadlines. Um, replication studies are supported. Studies that seek to determine whether similar results are found when certain aspects of a previous study's method and a procedures are systematically varied. And so uh, th those things are, are, are definitely um, uh, projects that we would consider for IUs. Resubmissions are multiple proposals from the same institutions. Make sure um, um, substantial changes have been made. And so if you've submitted a proposal, it was declined, and you are making revisions, um, making sure that there's a su substantial changes. You don't just go in there and, and just do a, a quick keyword search and change a few words here or there, but you're really being more thoughtful and really thinking through. Y yes, you have the feedback from the panel, but really, when time changes, the scenario on your campus may change, right? And so there there should be some changes to your proposal just based off of on the ground data that has changed from year to year that has now impacted your proposal and the idea. Um, and, and really, you know, especially if you're doing the work in STEM teacher preparation, it should encourage you to talk to all the stakeholders who are involved with STEM teacher preparation and what impact um, that has, and, and, and those changes should be reflected in the revision of your proposal. I don't think we have time for some of these fact checks, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to click through the slides so you can kind of see them. Um, and I'll um, kind of highlight the, at least the first one. All proposals must have a research component. That is false. But all proposals must generate new knowledge, and this may be through the research component or through a robust evaluation. Um, and the last one, I'll do the first and the last. Proposal writers only need reference to solicitation and their, and, their, and their preparation, which is false. All NSF proposals must follow the PAPG guidelines. And as I mentioned, the new PAPG came out in May 20th of 2024, so I would highly recommend that you review that to make sure that you are uh, in, in compliance with um, the current requirements. Uh, which of the following may receive IU's funding? Oh, 
all of them. So all of these areas um, may or qualify for STEM funding. So I'll open up for a few more questions. I know we have about 15 more minutes, but I'll open up for a few more questions now. And I'll go to the chat because I see there's seven new things here. Um, and so how do you identify, hopefully the external evaluators, I might have helped that you, you may want to start locally on your campus um, to identifying uh, external evaluators and or working with your, your grants office. Um, that's that's where I started. I, did, I didn't really introduce myself. I'm Jennifer Ellis. I'm also a rotating program officer from the University of Tennessee at Chattanooga, um, where I am a full professor. And this is my fourth year at NSF as a rotating program officer. And so as a former PI, I, I initially worked there and I asked, you know, who did so-and-so use as their evaluator? And then, and or I may have asked, you know, how did, you know, Dr. X you know, who, who did you use? And so I had conversations on campus uh, with folks across campus on who do they use for external evaluators? And that's honestly, even that's where I even found out that, oh, I don't have to hire a large firm that wants to take 50% of my budget to do the evaluation. I can, uh, I can add someone, a junior faculty member in psychology um, as an external evaluator. Yeah. So there's multiple ways to, to find and identify external evaluators. And so I see a question from Sean Thompson. Sean, if you want to give your question voice, that may be helpful for me. Uh, yeah. So one of the reasons I was looking at this grant is we have just started piloting this year, creating a uh, basically a crash course pedagogy for research based and inclusive practices for undergrads who are serving as TAs for the intro bio and intro chem classes to make that a better uh, experience, especially since those are often our large lecture classes. Um, mm -hmm. I didn't know, uh, as we started looking at what this is going to um, maybe hopefully evolve into across campus and stuff, if this was a grant we could use to help expand that and do some research into showing this is an effective way to um, engage the students, assist them and have better uh, learning outcomes in the STEM classes. Yeah, I would I would recommend you if you were to email you email me. I would for your forward your email to one of my colleagues, Olivia Long, and she kind of she kind of like I kind of dance between undergraduate and um, engineering education and STEM teacher preparation. She does the same dance in biology and STEM teacher preparation, and so just from that very brief um, description that you provided to me, it leans more biology undergraduate STEM education, I use yes, but more, I mean, not STEM teacher pre preparation, I, biology I use versus STEM teacher preparation I use, if that makes sense. Yeah, that does. Thank you. Yeah. And so Olivia Long, but you can email me and I can forward it to her. Um, so, and I'm going to go, I see uh, Shannon, you have a question. I think I should be able to get to the slides that will talk about that. Um, Oh, can I explain question three? I can go back in a section. So that some some of our dear colleague letters, um, if they if they don't have an expiration date, I see there's one about letters uh, for persons with a disability. Yes, feel free to apply and include that in your um, proposal. Make sure it's really clear that you're um, addressing that particular dear colleague letter, and we can kind of help you with this. Oh, that already been established. Could this be used to establish STEM education? So this is not necessarily seed money to establish a new program, um, but um, Dr. Cass, we can have a discussion about that. Feel free to email me because I'm not necessarily, I don't want to give you a blanket yes, no, just based off of this one question. I'm going to go ahead to the to my slide deck now. Um, so we, we do have, you know, we, we talked a little bit about the projects that are predominantly research studies uh, may be submitted to each track. Uh, research studies may explore these areas of creation, exploration, or implementation of tools, research, resources, and models, um, diffusion of widespread practices through the community, and effective professional development. IUS does provide uh, funding for workshops and conference proposals. I will say this is an interesting year. 
funding wise for the National Science Foundation for many for many reasons. And so, yes, we do have funding for these types of things, but we we have to be a little bit more conservative now until we um, have a better um, understanding of our full budget. So, yes, you can have conversations with program officers about workshops and potential conference proposals, or if you have a current IUS grant and you want to seek a supplement, you can have the conversations, but I wanted to be kind of frank with you now where we are with respect to our, our budgets, and it's we're still not um, sure. Um, what our, our true budgets are going to be, but we we will we um, and and so we're not sure how and in what ways we can support workshops and conferences, but we are definitely engaging in those conversations now and um, and and to be able to determine what can and cannot be funded. So make sure you reach out to NSF program officers for those particular um, discussions. I think we talked about those, and I wanted to kind of jump to some some tick some tips for success. Successful I use proposals will build on what's known, summarizing the, pub the published li literature, um, include a well-designed plan to, get, to gather data, um, specify methods of analysis that would be em employed to answer the questions poised, includes mechanisms to evaluate the success of the project, explain how findings and materials will be shared, address the sustainability of project efforts, collaborate as needed with other investigators, institutions, or communities. And when I say communities, also think about your um, your community college partners and, and the role that they play in the development of your STEM teachers. Are there some things that you may want to do um, or you've, you've identified just across campus that yeah, it may be helpful to talk to our community college partners because when students transfer over, they may be better prepared in this versus our students. And what are they doing at this community college here? Or are there different ways in which we can kind of get more synergy on these particular um, general education courses that impact STEM teacher preparation? Um, and they're really focusing on the make, making the intellectual um, when you're writing your proposal, that it's very your proposal that you make the intellectual merit and broader impact very obvious. When you're when you're going through the merit review process, those are the two key areas that your reviewers are going to focus on. Um, the, and so, when you're thinking about um, think about those, what is the potential for the proposed activity to advance knowledge and understanding within its own field or across different fields, um, really with the intellectual merit and how does it benefit society or advance desired societal outcomes, such a broader impact? Who will be affected by this? And so sometimes people like to define broader impact to very narrowly, like, oh, I'm just going to focus on diversity. And, and in today's climate, you may not be able to do that. And so if that's what your vision was or your what, how the box that you put broader impact on, um, we really need you to think bigger about broader impact and really who truly will be affected by this project and the, the, the what is a greater benefit to society of the work that you're doing. To what extent does a proposed activity suggest and explore creative, original, or potentially transformative concepts? Some examples of intellectual merit. Give context for your research. Is this part of a larger program? What are you building on? What are the building? What is this building towards? Would it lead to new questions, techniques, or insights? Um, what's the new idea? Why, why is now the right time? Why are you, why are you your, the right person or the right team to do this kind of work? Are there applications or connections to other fields? Um, again, I mentioned crypto, you know, on the slide it says crypto and medicine, microelectronics, AI. Are there other technologies or concepts that are, are that are going on or that are relevant to STEM in your in your regional area that um, can be in, integrated into your your project or would impact the field. Some broader impact examples, mentoring, undergraduate or graduate student, postdocs, etc. Um, education, advising, research, developing new courses, writing textbooks, um, your outreach, if it's math circles, working in prisons, public talks. And I think one of the questions was kind of, you didn't use the term outreach, but those are outreach activities that you you were mentioning. Broadening participation with organizations on your, or on or on your own, professional services with organ, organizing conferences, edit, editorial boards, professional societies, really thinking about what are those broader impacts of your, of your work. I mentioned the PAPG, which again was the PAPG 24-1, which is the current one. Um, 
making sure you document your collaboration efforts. Um, those are made through letters of collaboration um, and they should be submitted um, to start the intent of the collaboration um, and make sure you, you use the letter from the, the language that is spelled out in the, on the PAPG. For those of you who kind of dance between I use and noise, um, those letters are different. Uh, and so making sure you, you submit the right kind of letter is important. Um, um, you, you, when you write your suppose, proposal, follow proposal, the guidelines, you work with your, your grants office or your sponsored research office. Um, and if you, and if at first you don't succeed, try, try again, don't, just don't get discouraged, contact your pro, your kind of the, um, the program officer who wrote the decline or others who are, um, deemed expert in I use in that area to have conversations on how to potentially revise and resubmit your proposal. Some generic tips for some, some additional trips, tips for success. Um, read, 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 read the program solicitation as well as the PAPG. Um, make sure you're familiar with research.gov. For those of you, um, we, we strongly recommend that you don't use grants.gov if grants.gov is even working. Um, Fastlane is no longer a thing um, for you to even consider. So research.gov is, is really important. Don't wait till the last minute. Um, and follow all the guidelines um, that are that are listed there. I know there was a question about timeline. When can you expect and expect awards? So it, it takes us six to seven months before you will find out um, whether or not you've been awarded. And sometimes that seven months is with an asterisk. And so when you're thinking about your timeline, go from there. You submitted the grant in <clears throat> January, and then then the date that you potentially are the award date would be sometime in June, July. And so what would be a, a start date? That's something that you can, that you determine. We don't tell you what date that needs to be. You can determine what that date is based off of that. And, and if you get to the, the place where um, this is considered for funding, there's always ways from which you can, oh, the things change. And oh, I, I thought we could start in July. Is it possible for us to start in, in actually August? Sure, those are things that are easily negotiated. So don't stress too much about what the due date is. Really making sure that you have a strong proposal is what's most important. That, um, that you know, really making sure it's very clear what the intellectual merit is, the broader impact that you provide clarity, coherence, and compliance to those different areas is important. Um, and if you're not familiar with the review process, um, I am actually looking for a few ad hoc reviewers for a noise panel. Uh, so if you want to, um, although I you can't be on a panel, but if you have never reviewed for NSF and you're looking for an opportunity to review, again, you can email me. I have some an opportunity for you if interested to serve as an ad hoc reviewer of an of a NSF proposal. If you've never done that before, I would love to have you uh, to share in that. Some program resources. I mentioned the PAPG a lot because it's changed and sometimes people make the assumption, oh, there may be subtle changes. Those subtle changes may have a, a more bigger impact on your proposal preparation than you thought. Um, these are some resources that are available for you. I did want to highlight towards the end of this, and I'm going to stay for overtime, so don't, I know I've got one minute left, but if you have questions and I didn't get to them, I'm I'm here. Um, I actually took the day off, um, so I'm here if you need, if you have some questions to ask. I wanted to highlight um, not only the, the noise program that I mentioned and um, and and the efforts that we have there, but there's also another program, the National STEM Teacher a uh, core pilot program that is new, that is um, uh, focusing on supporting and, and really elevating STEM teachers who are, are in-service teachers. Um, the EDU core research program, um, ATE, discovery research programs, or the DRK-12, these are all programs that you may find um, also um, supportive of some of your research agendas. We will have um, some open office hours for noise, and, and within our noise program, we will take questions for the IUSE STEM teacher preparation, and then IUSE also has open office hours. And so I, in the information that you will receive from AAAS, I will include those dates for the open office hours for both programs, and so you're just more than just willing to just join them. Um, and we will love to answer whatever questions you may have about those programs.
And I mentioned being a re reviewer. We would love to have you be a reviewer. If you're interested in, in serving, even as a uh, rotating program officer, feel free to contact me. My email is there, Jennifer Ellis. I'm the first one. Um, let's list it there. And then, you know, making sure that you um, know more about the program. So if you're thinking about, I'm not sure, I'm ready to submit a proposal in, in, in uh, January, but hey, I would love to serve as a reviewer. Um, please reach please reach out to us and we would love to have you um, have you serve as a reviewer. No, we if you aren't sir, if you don't get selected, it's not because we don't like you. It may be because you selected that you were only available Monday and Wednesday and the majority of the people we asked were available Tuesday and Thursday. Sometimes it's just as simple as that and it has nothing to do with your credentials. So I don't want you to take it personal if you get like, oh, we, we weren't able to use you. Thank you for your interest in improving undergraduate STEM education, particularly related to um, pre uh, preparing um, pre-service um, STEM teachers. If you have questions, again, I'm here to answer them. And I just wanted to thank you again for your time. And I think I went over by a minute, which is not bad because we did have to take at least a minute or two to fix those black boxes. So I will stop sharing so we can uh, chat if you need. And we will receive the uh, PowerPoint, correct? Yes. And so I can put my email in the chat again. I didn't, I know some people might head up to job off because we have hard stops, but are there any questions? I have a quick question, um, sure. Jennifer. So um, I'm writing a proposal now and hopefully we'll be able to submit um, in January. Um, as part of the broader impact, <clears throat> so this is a idea of uh, developing a course with more student engagement. And as part of the broader impact, um, the idea is, uh, at least one of the ideas I have is to um, host conference where we will be um, letting you know other college uh, universities uh, locally and then nationally too to let them know what we have done and uh, what the result is. Um, one of the thing I I keep going back and forward is it better to also include high school teachers or is it better to keep it for undergraduate faculty um, as part of the conference as participants. What would you suggest? Again, it, it depends on who you're asking money for for the conference, right? So if it's I use, you, you, we're going to expect yes, yes, that you know you'll be supporting undergraduate students, right? And so could teachers come as right. well? Okay. Yes, but you know, okay. uh, again, remember the name of of who you're asking money from, and who we would be expecting to be the the beneficiary of those monies. Okay. Yeah, I was thinking undergraduate faculty, yeah, is better, but just wanted to double check. Thank you. Um, uh, Jennifer, I have a question about the evaluation, uh, external evaluators. I'm new. I, I wonder, like, is there any certain ways you want the external evaluator to uh, devise their evaluation plan? Or is it the project team needs to help them craft that evaluation plan? Or what kind of evaluation plan that you're hoping they develop? I guess it depends on your team, right? So if you have someone on your team who is also an evaluator and they feel comfortable as you're drafting a proposal to mm -hmm. help with de just designing the evaluation plan and in consultation with your potential external evaluator, mm -hmm. then then sure, but um, you know, there's there's multiple approaches to it. Sometimes people, you know, assuming you're not waiting till the eleventh hour, you know, you you wait, you you collaborate with that particular external evaluator, and they will provide you with the that um, you know the, the verbiage or the the text and the in the information that needs to be included. So we don't have a you know NSF doesn't have a standard of this is what you have to do, but there's multiple approaches to that.
Anything else? I know Drew has a survey. Did you put it in the chat already? I don't no, believe do you not have... we'll, we'll drop it in now. Okay. If you don't mind, I have another question. I saw the sure. Q3 that says, you know, you could be uh, both STEM and non-STEM major. So the, mm -hmm. the proposed study could be, and we're one in one of those categories. It seems like it could, because we, we are developing a tool that can be used in different courses and majors, but STEM is certainly the one that could be used. I think, do you consider that be still be um, like not a good fit or a fit? So you have- As a teaching, Peter. yeah, so, the tool or the technology tool we're developing can be used by teachers of STEM teachers, but it could also be used by non-STEM teachers. Yeah, uh, I mean, that, yeah, that that, that's, that should be sounds fine. like it's, yeah, it sounds fine. The other thing is the, per, the, the, the solicitation seemed to emphasize uh, teacher professional development. Are our tools more geared towards empowering the teachers while they're teaching the students? Is that considered within the scope? And we're not, you know, it's not a separate activity that actually we're supporting them while they're still teaching. I guess it could be a both and, right? So mm -hmm. if you have, you know, let's say, you know, a lot of a lot of uh, teacher preparation programs have either a residency model or some kind of you know traditional mm -hmm. um, student teaching, or they have field experiences where it's where this where these undergraduate students are going to the classrooms to teach. And so, if if what you're proposing is that they use this new technology or this new approach and they integrate that during those field experiences. Um, then sure, and then you, you you know you're developing a course around that uh, on how to effectively integrate this for to enhance you know pedagogical mm -hmm. content knowledge or technological pedagogical content knowledge. Yeah, that sounds like a good fit for I use. Thank you. Any other questions? I think I got most of the ones that were in the chat that I could see. And if I didn't, you know, feel, feel free to email me. Thank you so much. Have a great weekend, everyone. Thanks so much, Jennifer. Um, yeah. As she said, we'll be sending around the slides and the recording once it's available. We'll make sure this gets emailed to y'all um, and they'll be posted on our websites. Um, my colleague Thomas has dropped a survey in the chat. We'll also send an email this afternoon, this afternoon with it. And if you want my taking a few minutes to send your feedback, that'd be great. So we can keep improving these series and make sure we answer the questions y'all have. And with that, thank you again for joining us today. And I hope you have a lovely weekend. Bye y'all. Thank, thank you. you all.